Hey guys, welcome back to Magic TV. My name's Craig, it's 12 o'clock on a Sunday, which means it's time for a Q&A. Now, this is where I take all the questions that you've asked over the course of the week, and I try to answer them to the best of my ability. Uh, first of all, thank you so much for the feedback last week on how much you think Netflix uh, should, should cost. I really, really appreciate it. Uh, if you want to be kept updated about Netflix, I did mention this on my Facebook. A lot of people have asked me, if you want to be kept updated on uh, uh, kind of when it's launching and who we've got involved. A couple of different ways. First of all, I post a lot of this stuff on my Instagram channel. Uh, secondly, if you go on to magictv.org and you go on the contact form, just put in your name and email address and uh, on the drop down menu, select Netrix, then we'll keep in touch with you uh, when something happens. We're aiming to launch in October, from the beginning of October. We are on track to do that. Uh, and I'm going to be uh, talking about this a little bit more. I don't want to spam this video with it, but if you want to be kept updated, that's the way to do it. And you won't get spam emails. We'll probably email you once every couple of weeks. Anyway, if there's a question that you want to have answered next week on the Q&A, do me a favor, drop it in the comments to this video, and I promise you I will get to it next week. Make sure it's in the comments this video. If it's anywhere else, I might not see it because there are so many questions that are asked on this channel. But with that in mind, and without further ado, let's get on with the questions. Okay, so the first question today is from Homecook290, Homecook290, and uh, Homecook290 says, when doing a gig, how many tricks do you have on you, and how many do you actually use? Also, how do you organize the routine from opening to closing trick? Now, there's a couple of videos that I want you to check out. Uh, I will talk about this a little bit. There's a couple of videos that I want you to check out that will probably answer your question with this. Uh, the first video I put on Magic Stuff, if you check the Magic Stuff playlist, um, it's called Creating Set Lists, and it's like a 45-minute video about how to actually analyze all of your magic, how to analyze all the routines you do, and then create set lists from an opening trick to a closing trick. That's worth looking at. The other one that I want you to look at, again on the Magic Stuff playlist, is Pocket Management, where I did a full video about where to put things in pockets and where they should go and why should they should go in that place and so on and so forth. And also, you might want to look at a video I did a couple of weeks ago, again on Magic Stuff, and it was all about what I keep in my close-up case. And I am doing a follow-up to that video soon, but that's something that you should also check out. Uh, because on those three videos, I talk an awful lot about gigging at gigs, what I use, Use, why I use it, how many routines that you should do during the course of uh, a set, a whole bunch of stuff. But to very quickly answer it now, how many tricks do I have on me? It very much depends, to be perfectly honest, on, on the gig. I, I, first of all, and I talked about this before, when I go to a gig, I look at what the gig is and I look at what I'm probably going to get myself into and I custom pack a close-up case based on that particular gig. So I might go to one gig on, uh, on a morning uh, and I might, so for example, this Saturday coming, which would be yesterday, I've got two gigs and one's in uh, sort of a Shropshire area, the other one's in the Midlands, I've got one in the afternoon, one in the evening, one's in an evening, it's table magic, it's a corporate type thing, there's big tables, it's going to be loud, it's going to be dark, the one in the day is a wedding, it's mix and mingle, it's outside. So I'm packing two completely different cases for that day, one for the mix and mingle, one for the, uh, for the evening reception, because what I do at a table, at a corporate event, where it's kind of dark and I need to project is very different to what I do outside. So first of all, don't just go, right, I've got my close-up case and that's it. Think about the gig beforehand and what's the best material to take with you. Then when you get to the gig, I kind of just like look in my case and I work out what's going to be best for that particular gig, if that makes sense. And I might change uh, an awful lot. I do actually change my routines up an awful lot. Um, I might have stuff in my pockets that I'm not gonna do, or uh, it might not be appropriate, but I'm not gonna know that until I actually go out and I actually start working at that gig. So a wedding that I did last weekend, I had a whole bunch of stuff on me, but it was outside, it was really hot, and it wouldn't have worked in that situation. The other week, I actually had a whole bunch of coin magic on me. I had to drop the coin magic because it was so hot. Everybody was just boiling. I, I was really struggling palming coins, to be perfectly honest. So I was like, I'm gonna drop the coin magic. I'm gonna focus on other stuff. So just because something goes in my case and goes with me to the actual gig, doesn't necessarily mean that I'm actually gonna do it there, but I like to be over-prepared. So I like to go to a gig with as much stuff as possible and then decide what's best at the gig there and then. Does that answer your question? Uh, how many do I actually use? Again, as I say, it very much depends. Look at the set list video for that. But what I try to do is I try to have a really visual opener 
and then I try to link from one routine to the other. So how can I go from one routine to the next in a really logical way? So other than, rather than going, here's my first trick, here's my next trick, here's my next trick, how am I actually going to transition from one trick to another, if that makes sense? Um, so yeah, and how do I organize your... Okay, so that answers that question. And uh, yeah, so, so, so hopefully that answers your question. You really want to look at those videos. I'm not going to rehash that stuff. It's all broken down in great detail there. But the big piece of advice I can give you is organize your close-up case before you even get to the gig based on what you think you, you're going to have there. Get there nice and early. And then when you see the layout and you see the environment and you've spoken to the clients, then you can change things around and you can mix things up. Uh, dependence. And also, obviously, you want to make sure, you know, I, I know certain people disagree with me. I was talking to my friend Steve Deller about this and Steve is adamant that you only need one set at a gig and you just have that one set and that's it and that's fine and I've worked with Steve and that absolutely works for him I don't like doing that I like to have multiple sets at a gig um, because let's say I'm working tables and the tables are really close to each other if I do something like a multiple card find on one table uh, and and when I do a multiple card find it's very visual people can see it from a distance if I'm then going to another table um, and and they they I, I could tell that they were looking at me on the first table. I don't want to do the same set because they've just seen it. I want to do something different. So there's that sort of stuff to take into consideration. And also, you need to think about angles if you're going to be performing surrounding. What I mean by that is if you're going to do something where you're holding out behind your hand, behind your back or something, uh, you want to be careful of the table behind you. Um, because if that, it's not just about the table you're performing for. If you're in an environment where everybody's around you, you have to take that into consideration. And that affects the tricks that you're actually going to perform. Um, so, yeah, I mean, there's a lot that you need to think of. But uh, go check out those videos that I mentioned to you. And hopefully this overview should help. OK, so another question from Home Cook 290 asking some great questions here, mate. How do you start learning? Do you recommend books, DVDs, YouTube? Then when practicing, how do you get honest reviews? I feel family members would say, oh, that was great. No feedback. Um, OK, so we'll take that in two parts. The first of all, uh, probably the most important part, how do you get honest reviews? And I'm, I'm guessing here that you mean honest reviews, not in terms of honest reviews of is this trick any good before I buy it? Honest reviews as in feedback on your performances. And you are right. You, you are absolutely right. Uh, it can be awkward at first because obviously family members are going to be inclined to tell you something's good when it's not. And if you perform for other magicians, a lot of the time, depending on the magician you perform for, they'll naturally say, oh, that's really good, when in actual fact they don't mean it. I've seen so many magicians that go, oh, that's absolutely brilliant, and they think it sucks, but they don't want to, uh, to tell the person that. So, so there's a few factors to take into consideration there. What I would say is there is no substitute to flight time. When you feel ready to start performing, I would go out and I would just go out, perform to as many people as possible for free. Don't worry about charging. You know, I think there's this, this thing because everybody talks about how much money magicians can make. I think that new people come into magic a lot of the time and they go, well, I'm not going to go and do this gig because, you know, I, I, I demand that you pay me £500 before I go and do that gig. But a lot of the time, if you want to become a really good magician, it's all about flight time. It's all about getting better. Now, where can you go and perform for free? There's a few places you can do it. Offer your services to your friends. If you've got friends uh, or family members that are throwing barbecues, say, hey, can I come along and do some magic? Um, because yes, your family will tell you if you, uh, that your family might not tell you if your trick is terrible, but complete strangers, there's a very good chance that they will. Um, approach some care homes uh, and, and ask them. That's a great place. Uh, that, you know, can I go around and do some magic? You know, I don't want to charge. I just want to go out and, and do some magic for you guys. You can even go in and, into a restaurant and, and rather than charging them, say, hey, you give, me, uh, you give me a couple of meals or a couple of meals a week or something, I'll come in and do some magic for you. Uh, and would that be okay? And that's a great place to start learning. There's no reason why you can't go and do it free initially to build up that flight time. Because the more you do something, the better you're going to get at it, right? Um, and and that's, the, that's the important thing. You want to perform in front of real people. Because when you start performing in front of real people, and by real people, I don't mean magicians, I don't mean family members, I mean real people. When you start performing in front of real people, you'll very quickly find out what works and what doesn't. I can't tell you the amount of times that I've practiced the trick and I've practiced the scripting and I've practiced
practiced the technique and the first time I've performed it in front of real people, I've very quickly discovered five or six problems that I either need to fix or I need to scrap the trick and, and find something else that suits me better. And you only find out that when you actually perform for real people. So get as much flight time as possible. That's how you get your feedback. Go to a bar. Go to a bar that you don't normally go to and go and sit at the bar and grab yourself a drink and start shuffling playing cards. You'll soon have somebody come over to you. I was meeting a friend at a hotel uh, nearby to where I live and we were outside and we, we were just grabbing a drink and we were both shuffling packs of cards. Within five minutes we had like five or six people over and we were showing them magic tricks. Uh, it's kind of an interesting thing. A lot of people haven't seen a live magician. So you sit there and you start doing basic sleight of hand. It's human nature. People are going to go, oh, what are you doing? Happens to me all the time on the train. When I'm going to uh, a gig on the train or I'm, I'm catching the train somewhere, uh, I'm doing a double lift or something and I'm just doing some color changes. People will go, oh my God, are you a magician? Can you show me a trick? Uh, that's the place that you want to go. And because they're complete strangers, they'll tell you They'll tell you if they, uh, if, they don't, if they don't think it's very good. And one more tip, by the way, if you're going out and performing um, and you want to get real feedback on what your performance was like, um, if you're doing a show, uh, this advice was given to me many, many years ago, go, go, uh, go to the toilets and close the door and lock yourself in one of the cubicles because you'll have people walking in and going, oh, did you see the magician? And then you'll really find out what they think. Because, you know, people can be nice sometimes, but you'll get an absolute honest answer when they don't think you're around. So that's something that you want to take into consideration. But I think the big piece of advice I can give you on getting honest feedback is just go out and get, get every single opportunity that you can to perform. Just go out and perform as much as you can. And the more you do it, the better you'll get at it. And, and you'll start to realise over time what's going to play well and what doesn't because you've got that experience. Okay, so the other question that uh, Homecook290 asked was, how do you start learning? Do you recommend books, DVDs, or YouTube? Well, really, it's up to you. I mean, uh, back, in the day, back in the day, when I was uh, first into magic, it was all about books, and there was a company called uh, Tricker Tape, uh, run by a company, run by a guy called Vic Pinto, and I bought VHS tapes from him, and uh, uh, Repro Magic used to have these uh, uh, videotapes that they produced of Simon Lovell's material, which is why I'm so fond of Simon Lovell's stuff. Um, but I mean, back in the day, 90% of the stuff that I learned was books. Now, books can be a pain in the butt sometimes. I love reading books. I love learning magic from books. Uh, but it, it can be difficult. You know, you've got to follow. Hang on, do this. Now do this. Now do this. It, it can sometimes be a lot easier to watch a DVD or a download. Um, really, it's ultimately up to you. There are some, the, the problem with YouTube, YouTube is a double-edged sword. There are some great, absolutely great channels on YouTube that teach basic tricks and they do them really well. But for every great channel that teaches great tricks, um, there's a hundred channels which is, hey, learn this tutorial for this trick and, and it's a blurry camera and it's like a 10 year old kid with shaky hands who hasn't got any clue what he's teaching and doesn't have a right to teach it and doesn't have a clue what he's talking about. And there's so many bad teachers of magic on YouTube. I haven't got a problem about people teaching magic on YouTube. I have a problem with people uh, teaching magic on YouTube that shouldn't teach magic. But if you want to use YouTube as an example, uh, a couple of great places on YouTube where you can have uh, sort of basic tutorials on how to do stuff. Uh, Michael O'Brien, if you don't know uh, O'Brien Magic, so Michael O'Brien, uh, on his YouTube channel, he sometimes does the odd tutorial or two, but he has a membership thing where you pay $1 and you get access to a whole bunch of videos. Uh, he's very, very good. Also, I'd recommend Pig Cake, uh, both Michael O'Brien and Pig Cake. I've actually um, uh, interviewed on this channel, but um, Pig Cake has the Pig Cake Academy. You can go check that out. Have a look at their interviews because they talk about this stuff on the interviews. Uh, also, Doug Conn, if you missed the interview that went up yesterday, go back and check it out. Doug Conn is a force to be reckoned with on YouTube, and he's got uh, a... Um, sort of a teaching program on YouTube, a membership program, that's absolutely well worth checking out. And it's also very inexpensively priced. Steve Faulkner, who I also have interviewed on this channel, he has a channel called Real Magic Reviews. Uh, and he also has an academy where you can pay money and you can learn lots and lots of magic. He's, uh, he's a really good guy. And if you're into the social media magic, 
uh, Ozzy fans, uh, which again, I interviewed, uh, I interviewed him and uh, we talked all about it and we talked about his membership, but he's got a, uh, a thing where uh, you pay a certain amount of money and it's more sort of visual social media style magic, but it's really, really good. And then, uh, and then if you want to wait around till about September, October, uh, I've got uh, the Netflix launching where, uh, you know, you, you've got access on launch to over 100 videos and then there's going to be more added every single week and there's some fantastic names. We've already announced Steve Della and Chris Congreve and John Carey and there's other huge names that we're going to be announcing over the next few weeks. Um, so there's lots of different places that you can go online to learn this stuff. Um, in terms of books and DVDs, if you want to get a DVD set, uh, good DVD sets to learn if you're into card magic or coin magic is the Easy to Master Card Miracles series and the Easy to Master Coin Miracles series, which was by Michael Amar, and they were produced by l, &L Publishing, and they're old now, but they're so old they're, they're new. It's still an amazing place to learn how to actually uh, do card magic and coin magic. That is phenomenal. Um, it's a great introduction to card magic and coin magic, and there's some brilliant effects in there. I'd also recommend any of John Gustafaro's downloads, Second Storm, uh, Brainstorm or anything like that, and any of his ebooks. Uh, I mean, there's a million people. I could I could be here recommending stuff to you until the cows come home. Um, but uh, uh, card, if you want to, Roberto Jobby Card College. If you're wanting books and you want a, a kind of an introduction into books, but you know, just 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 immerse yourself in this weird and wonderful world. And when it comes to buying stuff. Don't don't have buyer's remorse. Don't go immediately in and buy everything. Look at the reviews. Check out the review channels. Check out places that write reviews and have a look at it. Make sure it's the right thing for you before you go in and rush and spend your money. Actually, you're going to end up with something that goes into your bottom drawer and you're, going to never, you're never going to use it. So hopefully that answered all your questions. Okay, so the next question is by Magic Magic Man. How are you doing, Magic Magic Man? Hey, Greg. Hey, Magic Magic Man. Have you had a chance to use the gravity reel in the real world yet at a gig? If so, how did it go? Your review was very positive, but I'm curious if the remote hookups are practical with real people in close proximity. No, I haven't done it in a real gig yet. However, I am planning, a little bit nervous about it actually, but I am planning on putting it into a gigging situation this Saturday. Um, which was yesterday. So I'll talk about it on the Q&A next week. Um, but um, of course, I'm filming this on Thursday. You're going to be seeing it on Sunday. Uh, but I'm planning on putting it into uh, a couple of gigs this weekend. I've spent a long time working with the Gravity Reel, more than I have any other prop, because I have no experience with, with ITR, with Invisible Thread. It's something that I've got literally no experience with. It's one of the few things in Magic that I've had no experience with. But I, I really like the Gravity Reel, so I've been wanting to like get it down, really get it down, really get it smooth before I actually go and work it. And also, the thing that I think a lot of people don't do with thread reels, any type of thread work, is I don't think they think about the lighting. And I think it's really important with thread work that you actually think about the lighting. So I've been experimenting with this. I've been, I've been using it in sort of a darker room. I've been using it outside and I've been getting my family to say, okay, can you see this? Can you see this? If I hold it here with the sun behind me, can you see this? I really want to kind of know everything about, about how a thread works in terms of lighting so I know where I can and where I can't do it. I, I need to be really prepared about this sort of stuff. So I am planning on putting it on this weekend and we're going to see how it goes. I still think it's really good. Hey, I might go and do it at a gig, die on my ass, think it's terrible and throw it in the bin. I doubt it because I spent so much time practicing it and I will report back to you guys and let you know what I think. But when you spend so much money on a floating device, you're absolutely going to try and make it work, right? Um, so yeah, keep your fingers crossed for me. Okay, so the next question is by Jay Lebowitz. Hey, Jay, how you doing? Um, you may have covered this before, but how do you decide on which new magic to buy? There is so much hype with every new trick that comes out and the prices vary. This is especially hard to figure out when you're new to magic. I got burnt a lot when I started with a lot of high price stuff that was overpromised and overhyped. I get burnt less thanks to you and other honest reviewers. Still, what kind of questions do you ask when you buy new magic so you don't get something that won't work for you and so you don't get snookered? Price doesn't seem to be much of a marker of quality, especially when it comes to downloads but when uh, but even when uh, even when it comes to physical products okay that's a great question and it's actually a question that I'm actually planning on putting into a magic stuff at some point down the line I'm doing a whole video on how to buy magic and I've, I've come up with a whole system about this I am going to kind of briefly talk about it now um, but look out for that video it's going to be coming soon um, so here's the thing. First of all, you've got to ask yourself a question. First of all, you've got to set your budget, right? You've got to work out how much disposable income that you've got. 
Um, I've, I've seen magicians that go, oh my God, I bought this trick and it was terrible and I didn't have this money to waste on a magic trick. Well, if you didn't have this money to waste on a magic trick, you shouldn't have bought it in the first place. It's as simple as that. Whenever you buy a magic trick, it should always be that you, you have that money allocated to buy that magic trick. Now, if you're a professional magician or a semi-professional, maybe it's you've got money allocated from the gigs that you're doing. I know some semi-pros that have a job and go out and do it semi-professionally. I know they just take all of the money from magic and and they use it to buy lots and lots of tricks and they, they basically use it to fund their hobby which is fantastic um, but obviously if you if you are a full-time magician you have to kind of set budgets and you have to kind of go well how much money am I going to spend on magic and and so so the first thing is understanding that the second thing is why are you wanting the trick and I think that's the most important question that you have to ask yourself when buying magic why are you wanting the trick because Ultimately, if you're a working pro, you probably don't need to buy another trick ever again. You probably need a supply of flash paper, <laughs> playing cards, Sharpie markers, and you know maybe envelopes for nest of wallets, I don't know, but you're never gonna need another trick again. You know, if, you, if you're a professional magician, there's probably not a single trick out there that's gonna revolutionize your career overnight. I hear a lot of the time, I hear magicians going, oh, I'm looking for that one trick, that one trick that's gonna make me famous. Well, nothing's gonna make you famous. You're gonna become famous by busting your ass and, 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 and doing something that nobody else is doing. And that doesn't necessarily mean the magic trick. That means uh, you know developing something in a completely different way. Like, look at John Vanderput, for example. There's a guy that was a very generic close-up magician. Nothing wrong with him, very skilled, but didn't really have a competitive advantage over anyone else that was going out there. Uh, he was just, like, doing well, doing well as a close-up magician. Then he goes and puts on a dragon suit uh, and uh, lets his personality, his self-depreciating humour shine, and now he's headlining Vegas. Well, you know, that's an example. He didn't buy a trick. He went and developed a whole new character and, and boom, yeah. So, so the point is, a trick is never going to make you famous. So why are you wanting to buy this trick? Now, if you're wanting to buy it because you love magic and it's a hobby and you think that you would like to know this trick secret and you want to know, learn how it works and you can imagine yourself doing this trick, then absolutely fine, buy it. But understand why you, know, why you want it. What's the reason for it? You want to put it in your act. Well, if you want to put it in your act, then you need to find out if it's practical for your act. So if you want to do it uh, in your act and you're a close-up magician, you need to figure out if, it's, if it works close-up. Let's look at Triple Helix, for example. I don't think that works in a formal close-up gigging situation. I don't think it works in a mix and mingle situation or a table hopping situation because there's too many problems with it. I think if you buy Triple Helix and you have bought it specifically to do gigging in a close-up environment where you're surrounded by people, I think you're gonna be disappointed. You would learn that by looking at the honest reviews about a particular product. Um, if you're a stage performer and you buy a trick and Let's just say that, uh, okay, so say for example, let's say it's a perfect example, the Malloy Master Prediction System, which is one of my favorite routines in my, in my stage illusion show. I absolutely love it. That's a stage trick. Box hanging from the ceiling, uh, and uh, you have somebody, you know, it predicts whatever you want it to predict. You open it up, and it's got a roll in there, and you unroll it, and it's predicted everything. Absolutely amazing. However, it requires an assistant backstage, to do something secretly in order to make this work. Well, if you haven't checked the reviews out and you've just looked at it and it's like, hey, this will be the closer to your show, boom, 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 and you spent a thousand, two thousand, three thousand dollars on this trick, and then you realize you need an assistant and you're never in a situation where you have an assistant because you've got a solo show and that's it. Well, that's gonna be a waste of money. So why are you wanting the trick and what environment are you performing it in? I think that's really important. If you're buying something for your everyday carry, um, that's great, but make sure that it is actually something that will work in the everyday carry. You know, that, that's, that's, that's important. Thy will be done is a perfect example. It's a great everyday carry item. Works really well. You put it in there. But, um, you know, you might not want to use tarot cards. That's the other thing. You know, do the props work with you? If you're a kid show performer and you do a lot of kid shows, pulling out a tarot card might not be appropriate. So there's all these different things that you need to factor in and take into consideration. And I think a lot of the time, the, the time, a lot of the time when people buy tricks and they end up not working for them is because they've been impulsed. And impulsed is an actual thing. You know, as somebody who spent many years working in a sales environment and teaching people, People, how to do sales, I understand about the art of impulsing. And, 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 and salespeople learn how to impulse people. I 
train my sales team in my office to impulse customers on the phone to book in a gig. I just do. Um, that's what a salesperson does. So, you know, the, the trailers that you see and the ad copy that you see written down and the phone call that you place with the dealer or whatever it may be, that's all designed to impulse you to buy that trick because they're ultimately a business. Murphy's Magic is a business. If they don't sell product, they're out of business. The, uh, the producer of the trick, if nobody buys their product, then they, uh, they're not going to make any money. They're going to go out of business. If the dealer doesn't sell any product, they're going to be out of business. So they're going to want you to buy as much stuff as possible and they're going to try and impulse you to do it. And that's what the trailer's for. That's what the ad cop is for. You need to look past that and stop yourself from being impulsed. Don't just do that add to cart, buy now. Oh, hang on a minute, do I really need this? Well, hang on a minute, let's check the reviews first of all. Let's have a look at this, right, okay. Oh, hang on, this is a negative review, this is bought up this. Oh, okay, let me just check Steve Faulkner, He's not, has he reviewed it? Yes, he has, let me check Mag Magic Orthodoxy, has he reviewed it? Yeah, has Michael O'Brien reviewed it? Has Tyler Lunsford reviewed it? Has Craig Petty reviewed it? Has Ryland reviewed it? Boom, 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 and very quickly, you're gonna get a really good idea of whether that trick works for you. And as I say, a lot of the time when people buy magic and it it's ends up in their bottom drawer, it's because they've just hit buy now without thinking about it. Um, and I would recommend not buying a pre-order. Um, I, I, unless you absolutely not, unless it's somebody you trust, unless it's like somebody's bought out. Of, so for example, Richard Sanders, everybody who watches this channel knows that Richard Sanders is my favorite magician. If Richard Sanders brings out a trick, I'm gonna buy it. Absolutely, because I just know that it's gonna be clever, it's gonna suit my act, I have years of experience performing Richard Sanders stuff, I just know it's gonna work. Flip side of that is Scott Alexander. Half of my cabaret show is Scott Alexander, but when he has a trick come out, I don't hit buy straight away because I know it's going to be bloody expensive. So I need to do some research into it first, not because I'm wondering if it's good or not, because I know it will be, but I'm wondering about whether I actually need it. So he bought something out recently, a newspaper thing, um, which was like $300, typical price for Scott, which is fine. And I was looking at it and I was like, you know what, I like that, but that's very similar to something else that I do. So I'm not gonna buy that. Despite what the reviews say, despite the fact it's Scott Alexander, I'm not gonna buy that because it's not going to be, it's not gonna replace the thing that I do. Which is the other thing that you need to consider. Is there something else that you do that's the same? If there is, why are you buying a new version of that? So for example, let's take Fly for example. We reviewed that recently on the review show. Me and Ryland hated it, that's our opinion. Um, but it's basically a ring flight, right? Now, if you've got a ring flight revolution, for example, that you've been using for years and you're really happy with it, why would you want to buy a ring flight? If you're really happy with the ring, it's not like it's gonna do anything different from, from the audience's point of view. You're gonna make a ring disappear, it's gonna go on a keychain. Well, that's gonna make a ring disappear and go on a keychain. Oh yeah, it's gonna go into the person's hand. But nobody's gonna think that. Everyone's gonna think, and you could also do Ring Fight Revolution by putting it in their hand and getting them to hold on to it and then it got. The point I'm trying to make is, a lot of the time we buy something just because we wanna learn the secret and because it's cool. And that's fine if it's a $10 download or a $15 ebook or whatever it is. But if it's a really expensive product, ask yourself if it's gonna replace something else you're doing and then do you want that to be replaced? Um, do, do you understand what I mean? Like why, you know, if you already do um, a version of that and you're happy with that version, why would you buy a new version of that? You know, unless it's got massive advantages there's, there's no need because you're either going to have to retire that previous trick. So there's a lot of factors you need to consideration. You need to consider, but the big piece of advice I give you is don't just immediately buy it. Do some research. Do your due diligence. Look into it. Look into the creator's reputation. Look into what tricks have come out before, and then ask yourself an honest question: Do you want it? Look at your budget. Can you afford it? Can you afford? Look, look at the worst case scenario. What's the best and worst case scenario? Best case scenario: I've got the best trick in the world. I'm going to do it all the time. Super amazing. What's the worst case scenario? Worst case scenario is it sucks. And it's terrible, and it went straight in the bin. You know, well, if you can afford to do it, it's not an issue. And also, look at the online platforms. I'm not going to talk about Netflix again, but I mentioned a whole bunch of online platforms previously. 
um, you know, that, that gives you bang for the buck. I don't know how much net, how much Netrix is going to be, but, you know, it's launching with 100, pro, uh, 100 different routines. There's also theory, there's stuff on marketing, uh, there's stuff on how to progress from each level, how to go from beginner to intermediate to advanced and how to, you know, there's a learning journey path on there. And we're putting new stuff on every single week. Well, the cost of that is going to probably be cheaper than a download. So, but you're going to have access to all of that and more. So, yeah, there's that to take into consideration as well. So hopefully that answered your question. There's a lot to think about there, but ultimately do your due diligence. Okay, so the next question is by Adini76. How are you doing, Adini76? Uh, he says about the sleeves that I talked about last week. And I think I then screwed up because last week somebody asked about uh, Magic's Biggest Secrets Revealed and I thought that we were talking about The Masked Magician so I gave him my thoughts on The Masked Magician. Adini76 is saying Magic Secrets Revealed is actually a YouTube channel here. Never heard of it. I hate it but yes, I've watched it. I know it sounds hypocritical but being a close-up worker like many, I wanted to know how the big stage illusions were done. He's exposed a lot and yes, including bases, black art, shading, mirrors, escapes, trunks, metamorphoses, water torture. He also exposed close-up things like linking rings, thumb tips, um, I've heard blah, 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 blah. Okay, I've never heard of it. Never heard of Magic Secrets Revealed. I will check it out and I will give you my thoughts next week. Uh, I mean, depending on how I think of it, I might be giving you my thoughts on the rant video. I don't know. Um, but I've, I've never even heard of it. It sounds like the guy's a complete and total asshole uh, if he's exposing all that sort of stuff. But I don't want to prejudge. I don't know. So thanks for bringing that YouTube channel for my attention. I'm going to look at it and I will get back to you next Sunday. Okay, so the next question is by Sean McNulty Magician. How are you doing, Sean? Hope you're well. Question is, in regard to pocket management, what's your thoughts of Joshua J's Pro Carrier? Um, I'll be honest with you. I'll be honest with you, Sean. Uh, all of these little things that are designed to carry um, playing cards and, and props and stuff, I just think they're a waste of money, to be perfectly honest. Nothing against Josh. Jay Sankey's bought stuff out like this before. Uh, I remember back in the day, like really back in the day, when I worked with uh, Russell Lee, so I've talked about it on the channel before, uh, Russell bought himself one of these holsters. Uh, I think they were called high caliber holsters or something like that. And it's like this sort of leather thing that goes underneath your jacket and there's space for thumb tips and coins and jumbo coins and all this stuff and it's just like all there and it gives you like the equivalent of an extra 20 or 30 pockets and um, my attitude is what's the point I, I honestly think having that little I mean if that wasn't so bad I still think it's stupid because it's just ridiculous that you know if you can't do a two-hour close-up job with putting stuff in this pocket 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 then I don't know maybe go back to the drawing board right I I I, I the problem that a lot of magicians have, especially when they're new to magic, especially when they're new to gigging, is they try to cram as much stuff into their pockets as possible. It's like, right, okay, I can fit three packs of cards in here, three packs of cards in here, I can fit in four wallets here, I can do uh, 25 different coin tricks here, right around my neck I can do this, uh, I can put this here, this here, this here, this here, right, I now have 437 tricks, and then they just go to the gig and all they do is ambush this card over and over again. And I don't know if it's because it gives them a sense of feeling of ah, I've got all of this stuff with me so I'm ready for anything but you end up not doing any of it and I think you can tell when people become um, kind of more experienced they start jettisoning some of that out of their pockets and they they kind of take a minimalistic view I know when I used to work restaurants a lot I used to just strip down what I took I, I, I did restaurants several times where I literally just took five coins in a shell because I was working on new coin material and I wanted to force myself to be able to just do coin magic at a gig. And I knew if I took a pack of cards with me, I'd do card magic. I know if I took a rope with me, I'd end up doing rope magic. So I stripped it down to its absolute bare basics. And I just did five coins. And I did that several times. I did that with packs of cards as well. Um, I think that we get obsessed with carrying too much stuff with us. And I think these little carriers, you don't need them. Else I think they look a bit ugly. Um, to be perfectly honest, I think that if you're considering getting one of these, I think it's much better to actually work on your pocket management. Go check out the pocket management video that I did that I talked about earlier. And I also think it's worth kind of really streamlining your tricks and thinking, you know, do I actually really need to carry that out with me? Do I need to carry that? Do I need to carry that? So the next question by Sean McNulty is, would you do a series on lectures such as Penguin Live, At The Table, Masterclass and do reviews? Um, I have reviewed the odd Penguin Live. So this Sunday, 
which is today. At nine o'clock, I've got a review show special on Kyle Purnell, and I'm going to be performing and reviewing a lot of Kyle's material. And one of the things I'm looking at is Kyle's recently released at the table, no, not at the table, Penguin Live lecture that's only just come out. Um, and I'm going to perform a routine off there. However, having said that, um, I am planning on doing some videos in the future. Uh, I really like the idea of comparing stuff and I'm going to do some, some comparison review shows. And what I mean by that is, you know, the five, uh, you know, take five at, at, at the table lectures and compare them to five Penguin Live lectures. Uh, uh, another one that I've liked the idea of is comparing see-through boxes, like comparing David Regal's Clarity Box and David Penn's box and John Allen's box and uh, Jose Miranda's box and comparing them and talking about the pros and cons so that's something that I'm planning on doing. The problem is the Penguin Lives come out every single week. And if I reviewed every single Penguin Live, that would take so long because it's a really long thing to watch as well. But I am planning on doing some, some specials. And I have talked to... The other thing that I'm planning on doing is a top 10. The 10 best uh, Penguin Lives of all time. The 10 best um, uh, at the tables of all time. The 10 best masterclasses of all time. Um, they've all got the pros and cons. I might even compare the actual... Uh, the actual concept, because there's four of them really, isn't there? There's the Masterclass by Vanishing Inc., there's the Alakazam Academies by Alakazam, At the Table by Murphys, and the, uh, the Penguin Lives by Penguin. Which are the best? Because they've all got pros and cons. Uh, they've all got uh, yeah, good points and bad points, in my opinion. So maybe I'll do a comparison of all of them. Let me know in the comments down below how you would like me to actually put those videos together, and I'll, I'll make it happen. Okay, so the next question again is by Sean McNulty Magician, and this question is, where can you get customized cards for, uh, where can you get customized cards? So, for example, my Marvelous Packet Trick, which I published on my At The Table lecture, instead of getting stickers, having them printed and made. Yeah, well, the best place is um, James Anthony. I've got it here. So James Anthony, who runs Magic World, he, he's got a YouTube channel with a review, uh, with a review show on there as well. Really nice guy. Um... He's got another website called printbymagic.com and they print directly onto bicycle playing cards and they that you, you can give them the artwork or they can uh, custom create it for you. Um, I'm looking at their website right now. They have a whole bunch of different stuff on there and they've got prices and, uh, and loads and loads of stuff. So printbymagic.com will print onto bicycle playing cards. So you want to check those guys out if you want to get some custom cards printed. Okay, so the next question is by David Blaine, and David asks, how you doing, buddy? Thanks again for commenting. Uh, he asks, what is 4F? I think he's talking about uh, last week's Q&A. Uh, somebody asked a question about my magical bucket list, and uh, one of the questions on the magical bucket list, uh, one of the things I said I wanted to do was appear at a 4F convention. So what's 4F? Well, I've got the website here. It stands for Fletcher's Finger Flicking Frolics, and uh, the website is uh, fffmagic.com and uh, it's uh, created by Obi O'Brien uh, who's uh, an incredible uh, performer he's released stuff through Bob Kohler in the past and uh, Obi's 4F convention is the original close-up magic convention and the most prestigious gathering of close-up magicians in the world since 1971 this by invitation event only event continues to feature the best performers creators and lecturers in the world um, so that's what it is. And um, yeah, the next one, we're planning on it being the biggest and best uh, from April 27th through April 30th, 2022. So there you go. You can't buy a ticket to it. The only way you can do it is by being invited. You'll see some people wearing a 4F badge, which looks like four playing cards with an F on each one. Um, yeah, you, can, you can't. I've, I've never never been invited. Um, and as I say, that's why it's my uh, it's on my bucket list. But um um, yeah, I mean, there's nothing really else to tell you about that. It's invitation only. Uh, it's all the big hitters that are there. You are required to perform. So when you go there, you have to actually perform in front of all the other delegates several times. So, um, you know, that's why you have to be at a certain level. Um, and some of my magical heroes go there. So, yeah, that's on my magical bucket list. But to answer your question, it stands for Fletcher's Finger Fling Flinging Frolics. So there you go. Okay, so the next question is by David Pargetta. How are you doing, David? Nice to hear from you. And this question is, I hear everybody talking about a deck of cards you're releasing soon that uses blank cards. Can you tell us anything about it? No, no, I can't. 
Uh, yeah, really, really, really can't. Uh, if you looked back at my video I did on um, um, what's in my close-up case, I pulled out a deck of cards and I said, oh, can't tell you about this. This is a project I'm bringing out through Murphy's. That's the deck of cards. All I can tell you is it uses blank cards. Um, I think that there's a couple of people talking about it because I've shown it to certain people. Elder Adam Wilbur has seen it. Um, John Bannon has seen it. Uh, quite a few people have seen it. Uh, John Allen, um, uh, he, uh, Lloyd Barnes, a whole bunch of people. There's about 15 or 20 people uh, that have seen this trick. And uh, yeah, it's it's probably, I, I, I think it's the best trick I've ever created, um, ever. Like, it's, it's really cool. Uh, I showed it to a couple of people when I was lecturing at uh, the Smoke and Mirrors. I, I, I performed it to a few people. Daniel Chard was there. Um, uh, a few other people and uh, I, I'm keeping it completely under my hat it's coming out through Murphy's I'm not really allowed to talk about it um, hopefully I think it's coming out September October time um, look out for it I'm really sorry I know, I know I like to try and be as open and honest as I can on these things but I, I'm not allowed to actually tell anyone about this trick other than it's coming soon and it's killer and it's the best thing I ever done, and it's fooled every single magician I've shown it to, including some huge names. And it's super practical, and you can do it anytime, anywhere. It's an instant reset, no table, completely self-working. It's cool. It's cool. So there you go. Um, just keep watching the channel. I'll talk about it when I'm allowed to. Uh, but yeah, that's what everyone's talking about. Okay, so the next question is by Sean McNulty, magician again. And thanks very much for the question, Sean. Really appreciate it. Uh, Sean's question is, in your opinion, what five DVDs should every magician have? Oh my gosh. I, I, you know what? If I thought about this, it would probably be a completely different um, set of DVDs because uh, the, the, when I answer these Q&As, I don't look at the questions beforehand. I literally just open up the laptop and I read the question and I answer it because I think that the best way to get a completely honest, off-the-cuff answer off me is if I haven't thought about the questions. Um, if I think about something, that's when I create a video about it. So if I thought about this, I might change my mind. Uh, and in actual fact, this might be a great topic for a video uh, moving on. But in no particular order i'm going to cheat i'm going to go rather than say five dvds i'm going to take talk about five dvd sets because i really do believe that l and l are the king of the dvd sets and i still think that some of their dvds are the best that have ever been made so and i miss those days these days everything that comes out it's like a single trick and a download and a single trick and a download we don't get many kind of really meaty projects anymore which i get really upset about but in no particular order i'm going to go for the worker series which i think there were four volumes uh, by Michael Close, that came out through L&L. &L. Um, if you're a working professional magician, Michael Close's Workers DVD sets have so much in them, they really do. Uh, and he did four volumes and he took the best of all of the Workers books and put them onto four DVDs. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna say that. I'm gonna say the Visions of Wonder, Tommy Wonder's DVD set that came out through L&L. &L. That's incredible. Uh, because just to see Tommy perform live and see some of the iconic magic that, you know, people talk about uh, is, is brilliant. You know, you see stuff like his two cup routine. You see stuff like the ring, the watch and the wallet. You see so many amazing routines and you see exactly what he's like as a performer. So I'm going to go with Tommy Wonder's DVD set. I'm also going to cheat and I'm going to say all of Michael Amar's DVDs in the Easy to Master series. So I think he did nine card DVDs and I think he did six money DVDs. So that's like 15 DVDs. I don't care, I'm cheating. I'm throwing them all in there. So all of the Michael Amar stuff, I think that's absolutely incredible. Um, for me, I remember when I was younger, and the, one of the most exciting times for me, maybe this is how sad I am, was when another three DVDs came out by Michael Amar. Oh my gosh, the next three Easy to Master series is out. Oh my gosh, this is going to be it. And then I would just literally watch them over and over again until the DVD worn out. And all of these, obviously, because Murphy's bought out L&L, &L, you can get all of these as downloads as well. Um, I'm going to go for the Richard Osterlund Mind Mysteries series. Uh, which is probably something that a lot of people weren't expecting off me because I don't do mentalism. But there's a lot of stuff in there that I do do. His radar deck is fantastic. His handling of Bank Knight is still one of the best handlings of Bank Knight you're ever going to see. So I love that. I really do. Um, so let's go with that. So so we've got the Worker series. We've got the Michael Amar series. We've got the... Um, uh, yeah, so what am I going to go with? I'm going to go with Doc Eason. 
Doc Eason's DVD set is absolutely incredible. I love Doc Eason's DVD set. Um, yeah, I, I mean, just to see him perform and there's so much magic that I do that I learned off Doc's DVD set, Bill and Lemon, uh, Card Under Glass, so much stuff I can just think about over and over again. And I'm going to do one more for you, which is the New York Coin Guys, uh, I think it was 16, 16 DVDs they did all together. And it was Jeff Latter, uh, it was Michael Rubenstein, David Roth, and uh, it was Mike Gallo. Uh, those four guys did a series of DVDs, which honestly covers everything you could possibly want to know about coin magic. If you're interested in getting into coin magic, buy those six DVDs and you'll not need to buy anything ever again. So for me, those are the best. Th th those five, I think the I might have given you a sixth one, I don't know. But those for me are the best DVD sets of all time. Uh, you will have so much material. You know what, I'm going to throw one more in. I don't care, Sean. I'm going to throw one more in because it's just popped into my head. Um, Bill Malone on the loose. I'm going to throw the Bill Malone DVD sets into there as well. There were four Bill Malone on the loose DVDs. Bill Malone is incredible. I learned so much from watching Bill Malone perform. The guy is a legend. So I'm going to throw Bill Malone in there as well. Um, so yeah, that's, that's my favourite DVD sets off the, off the cuff of all time. So the final question is by David Jane. Hey David, how are you doing? And David asks, I am a close-up magician. I am also a kids magician. Uh, do you find doing close-up and kids' magic negatively impacts one or the other? What's your thought process? Okay, well, that's a really good question. Well, here's the thing. I don't really do as much kids' magic as I used to. I still do it. I still do it quite a lot, but nowhere near as much as I used to, uh, just because I haven't got time with everything else that goes on. But the reason when I set up the company, so when I set up, you guys know I've got two slightly unusual non-stop kids' entertainment. The reason I kept them completely separate to each other is because I didn't want there to be a crossover. When I set up non-stop kids' entertainment, it was just me and Russell. When we set it up together, it was just me and Russ going out. It was just us two. There was nobody else involved in it. And obviously that grew over time. The same as Slightly Unusual. When Slightly Unusual was set up, it was just me and Russ. And then it grew over time. Um, and we wanted to keep it separate right from the very beginning. Not because we had aspirations of building up a huge, massive company. But because, in our mind, if you were a company, uh, if you are an event planner organising like a corporate dinner, and you went onto a website and you saw there, there was information about, hey, I do kids parties and you're there in a really colourful outfit, um, you know, waving a magic wand or holding a balloon model or something. Then that's going to turn them off because that's not the person they want for their events. It doesn't matter how good you are. It doesn't matter how good your show reel is. They're just not going to like that. They're just that's just going to immediately turn them off. Likewise, if you're a parent looking for a kid's party and they see, you know, videos of you performing on stage and big illusions and everything, you're going to think, well, that's just not what I'm looking for. That's too big and grand. I just need somebody to come along and do my kid's party. So we kept the two completely and totally separate. And now fast forward all these years, they're still completely and totally separate. And yes, there is a little bit, a little bit of cross selling. So people will book kids entertain with non-stop kids and they'll say hey we've got an event you know we also want a magician can you recommend a magician well actually we've got a sister company called slightly unusual it works in reverse somebody might book an illusion act and they go well, you know we need something to look after the kids can you help us well actually we've got a kids entertainment company you can definitely help you with that so there is a bit of cross promotion but generally as a rule we keep the two completely separate and i think that that's what you need to do i think that if you do kids magic you need to keep it completely separate from corporates. I, I, I know that there's some people that don't, and that's fine. This is only my opinion. Um, but I know from speaking to, I, I know a lot of event planners, and I know a lot of them have uh, been turned off from using particular magicians because they've seen a video or something of them performing a kid's show. Uh, so try and keep it as separate as possible. I've also seen magicians that have like a landing page and it's like, click here for kids magic, click here for close up. That's just as bad in my opinion, because you're still saying to them, hey, I do kid shows uh, and I also do close up. So I, I think that's just as bad. I think you need to keep it completely separate. Um, Chris Dugdale talks about this. If you go check out the Chris Dugdale interview on Talk Magic, he talks about this snapshot moment. It's actually expanded on in great detail in his XYA book. And, and he talks about this snapshot moment. And what he basically says is, imagine when you're performing, somebody takes a snapshot of that performance and shows it to a client. Is that what you want that client to see? 
Well, I don't want somebody who wants to book me for a high-end corporate event where I'm suited and booted and I'm being suave and sophisticated, as suave and sophisticated as I can be. I don't want to have that event planner or that client or that booker see me standing in a garden with 15 kids, waving a magic wand around, being silly, hitting myself in the head. I just don't want that snapshot. I don't want them to see that. So the way that I don't have them see that is by keeping stuff as separate as I possibly can. There is no mention on either website about the other company. It is completely and totally separate in every way, shape and form. And I think that's the way that you do it. So if you're a kid's entertainer, and you're also a close-up magician, keep them separate. Now, the only time I'd say that that's not the case is if you're a close-up magician and you do, for example, exclusively family events and maybe family restaurants. If you do family events and family restaurants where the selling point is you want somebody there to entertain the kids and the adults, and you want somebody who can do both, then absolutely, it's not a problem. I do kids shows, but I also do events where the whole family's there. I'll make it fun for the whole family. And uh, hey, yeah, you go into a restaurant. Yeah, 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 yeah. I can come round and I can, you know, I, I, I do kids parties so I can make sure the kids have a great time, make them a balloon model. But I also do uh, sort of close-up magic so I can make sure that the adults there have a good time as well. I can just keep all of your guests entertained. Awesome selling point. So if you're, if you're a close-up magician, there's nothing wrong with that. I've said this on the channel before. I've ranted about this. I love, close, I love kids magicians uh, if you, and kids entertainers. If you are um, a magician that focuses more on that family end and on the kids side and the family side, then I don't think it's really too much of an issue. But if you're after sort of the wedding clients or the corporate clients or the people where they specifically want an adult magician then I think you need to eliminate that crossover. So there you go guys that is another Q&A in the bag as Ryan would say. Do me a favour and let me know in the comments down below what you think. Do you agree? Do you disagree? And also don't forget if you've got any other questions please let me know. I love questions. Absolutely love questions. So any questions that you've got leave them in the comments of this video. I'm going to get to them next Sunday. Absolutely fine. Not a problem at all. And also don't forget if you want to see more videos like this like the video, subscribe to the channel, leave a comment down below. At nine o'clock tonight I have a review show special with Kyle Purnell. So I'm going to interview Kyle. I'm going to do a mini interview with him about his products. And then I'm going to be performing and reviewing some of his tricks. And in my opinion, I'm going to be performing and reviewing a trick that I think is the best packet trick I have ever seen. You guys know I love packet tricks. I'm going to be performing a Kyle Purnell trick that's not marketed. You can only get it through one of his projects. And I think it's the best version of this plot and one of the best packet tricks I've ever seen. Um, so look out for that. That's going to be at nine o'clock tonight. Uh, outside of that, once again, thanks very much for uh, supporting the channel. Don't forget to leave a comment down below. Go on to magictv.org and fill in the contact form if you want to find out more about Netflix. And I'll be back again later on tonight with the Kyle Purnell Review Show Special. I'll see you then. My name's Craig from Magic TV.